Throughout history, there have been some truly incredible warships, but there's also been a pretty decent share of awful warship designs as well. It was a space where different nations competed with one another, often with short notice and little time to design the biggest, the best, and the most innovative, but sometimes that drive for innovation could lead to failure. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the true story of five more bizarre and terrible warships from history. Sometimes a design can look good on paper, but then when the thing's actually knocked out of steel and iron, it just doesn't work at all. Enter the strange Russian circular ironclads, the Novgorod and her half-sister, the Vitse Admiral Popov. The basic idea behind these defensive monitors was based on the theory of Scottish shipbuilder John Elder, to shorten the hull of the ship and widen the beam, or its width, thereby reducing the total area needed to be covered by armour while also improving manoeuvrability. Russian Vice Admiral A. A. Popov took the idea and ran with it, widening the beam so much that the ship became almost completely circular and flattening the bottoms entirely to totally minimise the draft, that is, how much of the ship sat underwater. This design would also allow for thicker armour overall, as well as the ability to carry larger and more powerful guns. That sounds great, right? Well, in the 1870s, for better or worse, the Novgorod and the slightly larger Vitse Admiral Popov, a pair of ships also known as the Popovkas, were built and were fully in service by 1877. Despite their peculiar design, the Popovkas did operate well under certain conditions. They were found to be very stable gun platforms with easy roll in good weather, and they would also be capable of firing in a full 360 degrees. And on top of this, they were extremely well protected for their time due to their heavy armour. The rounded deck made use of 2.75 inches or 70 millimetres of armour consisting of three layers of plating. The lower section of the funnels at the base of the engine room skylight had armour plates that were a whopping 6 inches or 150 millimetres thick. They also had decent firing capability. While the rate of fire was slow, at about one round every 10 minutes or so, the guns could effectively penetrate 11 inches or 28 centimetres of armour at a distance of 800 yards or 731 metres. Initially, the Imperial Russian Navy liked Popov's idea so much, they ordered a fleet of 10 of the things, planning to use them as coastal defence ships in the Kirk Straits in the mouth of the Dnieper River. However, this plan would prove too expensive, and in the end, probably fortunately, only two were ever commissioned. Once the ships were built, it was found that they suffered from some rather serious design flaws. Firstly, steering was nearly impossible, with the comparatively light hull and slow speeds proving ineffective against the rather strong currents in the Dnieper River. Fred T. Jane, the famous warship historian, was quoted as saying, on a trial cruise, the Novgorod and the Vitse Admiral Popov went up the Dnieper very nicely for some distance, until they turned to retire. Then, the current caught them, they were carried out to sea, whirled helplessly round and around, with every soul on board helplessly incapacitated by vertigo. They are also prone to rapid rolling and anything but flat calm in the Black Sea, which itself was known for its rough and turbulent weather. In severe cases, heavy storms would cause the ship to pitch enough so as to lift her propellers out of the water, and on top of this, it's said that the recoil of firing even a single gun could reportedly cause the ships to spin out of control, with their underpowered engines and propellers unable to set them straight again. And this was when seas were calm enough to allow the ships to reliably fire those guns in the first place. The design flaws don't just end there. The circular hull created massive amounts of resistance and drag, and the six outer propellers were found to do little to nothing at all to combat this. The hull shape also rendered the rudder almost useless, and the ship reportedly could take up to 45 minutes to make a full circle, and the flat bottom design didn't help either, causing the ships to act like skimming dishes on the water, offering even less control and steering accuracy. The circular design itself proved to not be a total failure, surprisingly. In 1880, a similar concept was used for the Russian imperial yacht Livadia, also the brainchild of Popov, with the yacht counterpart, Popov kept the circular hull but added a conventional bow and stern. Called a gigantic life-size experiment, and despite having been used only once for her intended purpose as a yacht, the Livadia's design was ultimately deemed a success, having learned from the failures of the Popovkas before her. 
She was surprisingly manoeuvrable and decently fast, surprising naval architects during her sea trials with her stability, and they deemed her to be just as efficient as any other conventionally designed ship. Overall though, the theory behind these ships made a decent amount of sense. The supposed manoeuvrability, coupled with heavy armament, the potential for all-round firepower, was a solid enough idea, especially when taking into account the limited scope with which these ships were meant to be used, essentially as coastal defence, and never in a true sea battle. Quickly, it became clear though that factors such as weather, gun recoil, and sea currents had other ideas in mind for these warships, rendering them terribly ineffective, causing them to go down in history as some of the worst warships ever designed. But despite this, the Popovkas would not be fully decommissioned until 1903, a full 30 years after they were launched. Widely considered to be the worst battleship ever built, the USS Massachusetts was a class-leading battleship that was built at the end of the 19th century for the US Navy. Unfortunately, inexperience in building this kind of ship would creep in and result in the vessel's failure. Commissioned in 1896, the Massachusetts was designed with sheer power in mind. At the time, she and her sisters, the Indiana and the Oregon, were the first true modern battleships in the American fleet, and as a result, they came with massive amounts of firepower. All three ships were fully decked out with four 8-inch secondary batteries amidships, and then two massive twin 13-inch gun turrets forward and aft. These were some of the largest guns ever built at the time, and it was believed that the Massachusetts could potentially be extremely powerful as a coastal defence vessel. Ultimately though, the designers failed to take the weight of all this machinery into consideration, and this would result in dire consequences for the ship. At 350 feet long and displacing around 10,000 long tons, the USS Massachusetts was a comparatively small ship that was simply over-encumbered by the weight of the guns and the ammunition that was fitted to her. As a result, when both of her 13-inch guns on either side were turned to aim at an enemy vessel or target, the movement would cause the whole ship to list so severely that the entire deck and even the guns on that side of the ship would be plunged temporarily underwater. It's interesting to note that at the time, the US Navy was still a developing power, and it was learning new lessons all the time. The Bureau of Ordnance oversaw the design of the ships, but needed to take input from the builders on what would or might not work. And coupled with a great sense of inexperience was the usual meddlesome political machine. And this was the first time a Navy had attempted to fit such a huge amount of firepower into such a small platform. And although the ships were experimental, and more like prototypes, because of this it would ultimately lead to their failure as a design. They were small, and they were cramped. Massachusetts and her sister ships only had nine line officers, which meant that they didn't have a dedicated officer for torpedoes, secondary battery, and main battery armament. But even worse for a combat vessel, they had no margin for officers killed or wounded in action. The failures of the Massachusetts class become quite obvious when you take into account the colossal weight that they were carrying. The two 13-inch gun turrets alone weighed 136,000 pounds or 68 tons each, and the shells used for these turrets each weighed a massive 1,130 pounds or 512 kilograms. Now that's not to say anything of the million pounds of coal required for the engines and the hundreds of thousands of pounds of ammo for the remaining guns on board. In her sea and gunnery trials, the unstable ship rolled heavily, unseating both of her main gun turrets, which jumped their retaining rings. They had to be set back, and bilge kills were hurriedly installed on either side of the ship to make her more stable. On top of all of this, the Massachusetts was also woefully under-armoured. While she was built with armoured sides that measured about 5 inches thick at the waterline, the armour was positioned too low, and this rendered its protection almost null. By contrast, the hull below the waterline was left totally unarmoured, and this oversight led to the Massachusetts nearly being sunk on three separate occasions during her career after hitting submerged objects. The Massachusetts was twice decommissioned and then recommissioned due to her flawed design. First in 1906, after an explosion of one of her turrets tragically killed nine aboard, and again just a few short years later in 1914, after spending most of her time laid up in the reserve fleet. But finally, in 1920, she was decommissioned for the final time, scuttled, and used, maybe fittingly, as target practice off the Pensacola coast of Florida. The story does have a somewhat wholesome ending though, 
1993, the wreck of the USS Massachusetts was officially named a Florida Underwater Archaeological Preserve. Even though she spent much of the last century underwater, the wreck is actually remarkably intact and teeming with fascinating wildlife. In fact, she's now become a well-documented artificial reef. And well lit by the sun and resting in relatively shallow sandy waters, the Massachusetts is conveniently positioned as a popular diving destination, giving divers the rare opportunity to get up close and personal with all manner of aquatic creatures, as well as one of history's greatest battleship blunders. Now there are some warships whose design flaws are largely mathematical or logistical miscalculations and many small factors that all come together to create a costly and embarrassing mishap for the country. They're mainly found under the hood and wouldn't be apparent to your average onlooker. But then we have the Osh, where the failings in her construction are pretty much obvious at first sight. She started out her life already at a disadvantage, having been ordered by the French in 1880, but not coming into service until a full 11 years later in 1891. The French shipyard which built her took so long to complete the project that by the time she was finished, the world had already moved on from ironclads like her, and as such, she was already basically obsolete upon launch. It doesn't take a warship historian to point out exactly what was wrong with the Osh. She was top heavy as all get out due to her very large superstructure and her low freeboard. In fact, her superstructure was so enormous, even for the time, that it earned her the nickname of the Grand Hotel. And this decision was made due to the fact that the French desperately wanted their warships to appear foreboding and menacing, hulking above the horizon in an aesthetic known as the Fierce Face. Her masts were positively massive, and her guns were mounted on almost every available surface. But this, however, led to some seriously unstable ships, which had difficulty at times keeping afloat under their own weight. The freeboard, on the other hand, was so low that the ship would struggle in anything but a flat calm, and couldn't sail far from the coast without danger of being swamped. Now, this was all compounded by the fact that she was overweight on completion, which meant that the Osh was entirely too unstable to be considered seaworthy by most accounts. And on top of the superstructure being altogether too tall, it was also fitted with numerous unnecessary windows, which were considered weak points in the armor scheme of the ship. But even further, the decision to extend the superstructure above the turrets was also controversial, because damage to this part of the superstructure could also damage or then block the gun turrets, thereby reducing firepower. The ship was towering and awkward, and not at all suitable for anything much further out from the coast, let alone an all-out sea battle. All this being said, the French were not ignorant to the issues presented by the Ush, and she sought many refits over the course of her career to correct these issues. In 1895, six of her guns were removed to help lighten up some of the heft that she was carrying, and then later, a more extensive refit lasting from 1899 to 1902 saw that the engines and boilers were replaced, the single large stack was brought down to two smaller ones, and then two of her torpedo tubes were removed. But perhaps most importantly, a large portion of the overwhelmingly tall superstructure was cut away to lower her centre of mass. Her intended waterline was restored so that her side armour was now able to effectively keep above the water. And after all was said and done, this behemoth was whittled down by about 250 tonnes. And after this refit, she proved to be much more stable. It appears that the French had learnt their lesson, though the Osh would still go on to be remembered as one of the worst warships ever to be put to sea. A lot of design failures we cover on this channel come from the late 1800s, and for good reason. This was an awkward time in warship design, when sail had just finally given way to steam, and new technology was appearing untested all the time. Now, one class of German gunboat was absolutely hated and despised by its crews, and the issues with this class were typified by the first one built, the SMS Vesper. Vesper was the result of some tactical thinking that dated way back to the Age of Sail, where bombarding enemy forces on shore or at sea was a challenge thanks to the limited range of guns. So the idea was to fit a powerful, long-range gun on as small a platform as possible so that the boat could retreat to shallow waterways where it would be out of the range and impossible to be chased by larger, more powerful enemy ships. In the 1870s, Germany had to defend itself from amphibious invasion, a coastal defence gunboat was just what it needed. But aside from being born of maybe outdated tactical thinking, the Vesper was also conceived under some other unusual circumstances. For example, the naval chief of staff at the time was a former cavalry general. And the Admiralty Design Office had total inexperience in designing such a ship, 
and the German steel industry was incapable of producing the steel plating, which had to be eventually imported from Britain for the first four vessels. Vesper, to be fair, differed from other gunboats from the time. Usually the guns were fixed in place and could rotate only by turning the whole ship, but Vesper improved on this because she was expected to engage the enemy in shallow water, maybe even with her bottom resting on the sea floor, so the gun would need to be trained and rotated on its own. Ten of the Vesper class were built, the first German warships to be built without sails, but it was about here that all the positive innovation ended. The boats were wide, slow, and extremely sluggish. They were hard to maneuver and turn. Despite their width, they had a tendency to heel in the water. This wasn't a huge problem though, because they weren't expected to stay out in the open ocean, but it still resulted in drawing ire from their crews for their poor seaworthiness. They were heavy too. The ship's bows were reinforced with thick plated armor to protect the forward end from where it would be pointed at the enemy. They were also extremely cramped. The ships were meant to be as small a target as practically possible, and the engineers achieved this goal, but at the expense of the crew. It also meant they had very limited range, because the boats just weren't big enough to fit a big coal bunker. The crews turned nasty. They called the boats mud bugs and tidal slippers. Some creative insults there. Just how effective these strange little ships were is characterized by the bizarre service history of Vesper herself. She was only commissioned a few times sporadically between 1876 and 1885. But in the end, technology overtook Vesper and her sisters when the first fast torpedo boat was introduced, consigning the German coastal gunboats to the history books. Vesper was sold and became a lighter in 1910. She was finally broken up. In the interwar period following 1918, the world's navy sat down and agreed to limit the size and number of their warships to prevent an arms race. This resulted in some pretty bizarre designs overall, but for one nation in particular, uh, an attempt at skirting around the guidelines and finding loopholes would result in absolute disaster. During the course of World War I, the Allies, comprising the UK, the US, France, Italy and Japan, had all built up impressive naval fleets. But immediately after the war, there was concern amongst the Allied powers of the potential for a naval arms race as this momentum continued. And that would prove costly for countries already reeling from the expenses of war, and unpopular with the public who were clamouring for peacetime. In an attempt to appease the public and slow further progression towards this arms race, the Washington Naval Treaty was signed in 1922 among the major Allied powers. Now, as part of this treaty, limits were placed on the size and weight of future warship construction in an attempt to keep any one navy from outclassing the others. But where the other signatories saw an agreement to equalise their navies, Japan instead saw loopholes. In an attempt to circumvent the limitations imposed by the treaty, the Imperial Japanese Navy, or the IJN, came up with the idea to build vessels that were too lightweight to be considered legitimate members of that category as per the treaty, but then outfit them as heavily as vessels twice their size. And by doing so, they were still bulking up their naval power, using smaller scale versions of the vessels that they had been producing for the war, without sacrificing on the firepower and therefore without technically violating any terms of the treaty. Enter the now infamous and illegal torpedo boat, the Tomazuru. The Tomazuru weighed in at only about 600 tons, but was positively overloaded with complex and heavy gun systems. Her high centre of gravity also led to serious stability issues in rough seas. Now it's rather easy to imagine how such a design may cause structural problems, and we now know these issues would sadly prove fatal. In what would become known as the Tomazuru Incident in March of 1934, during a routine nighttime torpedo exercise in rough weather, radio contact with the Tomazuru was suddenly lost. Initially it was assumed to be the result of power loss or radio failure, but 15 minutes later however, Tomazuru's lights were completely dark. A search and rescue mission would find the Tomazuru capsized, floating completely upside down, some 10 hours later. The ship was ultimately towed to shore, and while 16 men somehow managed to survive, 100 sailors, including the captain, sadly perished in the disaster. The Tomazuru incident was ultimately attributed to the myriad design flaws present on the ship. The structure was horrifically top-heavy, fitted with far too many heavy guns and munitions for the ship's comparatively small size. 
Munitions were also fully loaded at the time of her capsizing, which had not been the case during her sea trials. And this also contributed to an even greater instability than originally feared. And with all of these factors taken together, combined with the unfavorable weather conditions, the Tomazuru had been completely unable to keep herself upright. As a result of the incident, a committee was established by the IJN to identify weaknesses across their entire fleet. Many vessels like Tomazuru had been designed with the exploit of a loophole in mind, and they were summarily declared to be unseaworthy. A total of 14 vessels were found to have potentially catastrophic stability issues, and these issues were summarily addressed and corrected. However, this incident would ultimately prove to be a scandal for the Japanese Navy, delaying the construction of new vessels for several crucial years while they sought to correct the errors in their present day fleet. Guns were downsized and reduced in number, deck heights were lowered, and excess equipment was removed, while bulges and ballasts were added to the hulls of the ships for stability. Now, whilst the Japanese undoubtedly believed their design concept was clever and that it would allow the freedom to build up their naval force while also circumventing the limitations created by the Washington Naval Treaty, in reality these concepts would have fatal consequences that sent shockwaves throughout the nation. Inevitably, they learnt from their mistakes, and the loopholes in the treaty were later closed as a result, but it was too little too late for the hundred men lost in the Tomazuru incident. All too often, lessons in ship design and construction are paid for in human lives, and it's this reason that makes the Tomazuru one of the worst warships ever built. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.